Hey, I'm Jake Runnestead, and uh, I'm a composer and conductor. And I got into music uh, from a very young age. When I was a kid, we did a lot of music in my home. We sang a lot around the house. My parents were both very musical. Uh, so my sister and I, we would sing along with them. Uh, we had a piano at home, and I began plunking up melodies that I had heard on the radio or at school or somewhere else. And then I started to embellish and add little chords, and then I started creating my own sounds. Um, and so I was writing little piano pieces, and then in high school, I wrote a lot of terrible love songs, and I was in a couple bands. Uh, and then I decided that I wanted to go to college to study music education. I was going to be a high school band director. And uh, I had a great band director in high school. Um, and so I went and I finished my degree, but um, kept composing and really that was my that was my true love and uh, and so when I finished my undergrad um, I met a composer named Libby Larson who encouraged me to really pursue composition and go to graduate school so uh, I went to the Peabody Conservatory and got my master's in composition uh, graduated still wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life but kept working uh, kept writing and uh, and now I'm able to do it uh, full-time So Dreams of the Fallen began uh, as a commission by pianist Jeffrey Beagle, and he wanted to commission a work for piano, chorus, and orchestra. So almost a piano concerto-like piece with full chorus and orchestra. And so I was trying to make sense of that ensemble. You know, when you have all those people on stage, and especially um, one person who's in the front, that solo pianist. And so uh, I was looking around for stories or themes and I came across this story in the New York Times where they were looking at um, individuals who had served in the, the military abroad and then had returned, especially in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and returned from the experience and tried to assimilate back into everyday life and how difficult that was because of what they experienced. And, and so I thought, well, that would be a really powerful story to tell through music. And so I began to search for texts. And at first I was looking at texts uh, about war throughout history and then a friend of mine recommended the poetry of Brian Turner and Brian was a poet first and then served in the military in Iraq and Afghanistan and um, and he has two collections of poetry that are published that are just incredibly powerful that talk about his experiences the difficulties the um, the idea of, of, of a, a friend of his being being killed by a bomb um, another friend who took his own life, uh, and then coming home and having all of these things ring and continue in, in your head, in your memories. Uh, and so I chose poems from those books and used those for the text of the piece. And so the piece really goes through this, this experience of, uh, of what it's like to serve, um, the, the violence of it, the intensity, but also um, the, the, the dreaming and wishing for being home or wishing for being with loved ones. Um, and then also once you return and, and how all those things stay with you and continue to be a part of your life. Uh, and so I worked with five different orchestras that came together to commission the piece, um, groups from all across the country. And so had performances with all of them with the pianist Jeffrey Beagle. And that was a really, really powerful experience. Well, networking, collaborating, uh, I think are really, really important parts of the, the job of being a musician. Um, I like to think of it more about um, creating meaningful relationships with people. I think that when you uh, really approach someone as a fellow human and not just a business transaction, that it makes everything that you do so much more meaningful. Um, I, I know I talked to lots of conductors who get emails from young composers that say, hey, here is a bunch of my music, I hope you can perform it. And that's just not the right approach. You know, you want to make a personal connection. So if you're emailing someone and you're trying to share your work, maybe you're a composer, or you're a performer, and you want to collaborate with someone, um, you know, introduce yourself, but also make a connection and, and talk about something about why you admire that performer or that conductor. And, uh, and share, you know, I heard this performance and I was so moved by it. And so I think that it would be a good fit for us to work together because blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and really try to foster that connection um, instead of, like I said, just making it transactional. 
Um, and then once you begin to collaborate, that's when really meaningful music making can happen. And that web, you know, you have two connections, and then once that happens, then this conductor might say, I really loved working with that person, so they're going to tell their friends. And then that web begins to broaden, and, uh, and then you're able to work with more people, which are going to get you more gigs, uh, and help you to eat much more. Um, so I think that's a really great way to approach it, just starting small, but really making those meaningful connections uh, so that you can begin to widen that web. So technology is a really amazing way to help get our music out into the world. I have a lot of videos on YouTube um, that ensembles have recorded. Uh, they've taken care of that and then they post them. And sometimes they'll, they'll ask for my permission and I'll grant it. And sometimes they just appear, which is, is still pretty exciting. Um, but it's, it's a really cool way to see what kind of life this music is having. And everyone has a different interpretation. And so it's amazing to see the diversity and variety of, of what people are bringing to that music to make it meaningful to their community. I have a piece called Please Stay that addresses uh, mental illness and suicide. And um, there's an amazing choir at Capital University in Ohio that perform this piece and have a beautiful video on YouTube. Um, and, uh, and, and so that has kind of become this, this social endeavor to, to address suicide prevention. Um, and, and many people have shared the videos and, and commented. And, and it's cool because it's also created a community. There was someone who posted on the video talking about their own struggles with mental illness and with suicide. And, and other people began to chime in and support that person and say that, you know, keep, keep trying, it gets better. And so I love the way that technology is able to bring us together uh, from all across the world. And it's happening through music, which is pretty amazing. So copyright law is a very important thing, and it's totally different all across the world. There are some cultures, like the culture here in the United States, that is pretty serious about copyright law. Um, but there are other cultures that freely duplicate you know, copies of music and um, in some cases don't necessarily know any better or don't understand how that functions and how that takes away money from, from the creators of the work. Um, but, but I think it's a, it's a really important thing for everyone to be completely educated about. And, and especially it's important for us as artists to protect our work. So anything that I send into the world, if someone wants a perusal score of mine, there's always some sort of protection on it. Maybe it's a watermark or there's a password to access the file. Um, but some way there's always protection um, because once something gets out into the world without protection, it can be freely shared and, and then it's harder to reel that back in and get it back. Um, and so uh, there are performing rights organizations like ASCAP and BMI that help to support artists that also offer royalties for performances of the artist's work. So if you're a composer, make sure that you register with one of those organizations so that whenever something is performed, that you receive royalties. It might not be much, but at least it's going to help to give you another stream of income. Um, and a quick note about that also, if you can get the, the program from the concert. You can submit that to ASCAP or to BMI um, if the ensemble hasn't done that already. That way they have a record of that performance. Um, also, if you're a composer and you're creating a new work and you want it officially protected by copyright law, you need to uh, submit it to the U.S. Copyright Office. So technically, when you create something and you write it down in some form, you own it. Right? You have that copyright. But if you want to uphold that in a court of law, you actually need a, the technical copyright granted from the U.S. government. So if you want that, you just need to submit that to that office. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it can be kind of complex to navigate all of the different avenues of copyright, but it's a really important thing for us artists to understand how it works. So when I create a new work, uh, in this context, let's talk about a vocal work. So there's always some sort of a text that I use. And so first what I do is really learn as much as I can about the text, once I've found it, which takes a very long time to find just the right one. Uh, but once I do, I really try to understand who wrote it and what was going on in the world in that person's life at the time that she or he wrote it. And then try to really figure out what, what, what that person's saying 
what the form of the text is. What are the, the scenes or the colors or the sounds or the feelings that come out of it? And that usually begins to dictate uh, a form, or uh, I like to think of it like a, you know, like a painting. There's a certain sound world or visual world that it that creates. And so then when I begin to, to create the music, it's all living within that world. Um, and so once I have a clear sense of what the text is all about, um, I really just take the words and I improvise singing them. Uh, and I, I just begin to find the inherent melodies within that text uh, and, uh, and just help to bring it to life in that way. So I'm actually just walking around and improvising um, and, and just finding what works well with, with those words. Um, and then those little melodies begin to, to form themselves and that's really the building blocks of the piece. So then from there, uh, everything is really based on those melodies, whether it's one main melody or two motives or whatever it might be, um, so that the whole piece feels like it's all connected. It's all based uh, from this one idea or these two ideas. Um, and I think that just helps to make everything feel like it's, it's a single whole, uh, as opposed to all these different things that try to come in that we try to do. Sometimes we throw in all these ideas, and it's like if you're cooking, and you're making you know, beautiful spaghetti bolognese, and you're making this sauce, and if you throw in all the spices, it tastes terrible, and you can't get any of those flavors. But if you know just what to add, and just very simple and high quality flavors, then it's this beautiful taste. Uh, and so I think that's a great metaphor for how we create music. Very high quality information, our content, uh, and just the right amount of spice, and it can be this beautiful meal. I think for a very long time I've felt most comfortable when I've been creating music. So it always just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, it was my, my home, was just creating uh, and making music. Um, and so I, I guess the point where I felt like it was um, what I wanted to do or it was really what I wanted to focus on uh, was when I began to, to understand what other people were being positively impacted by the music or by what I was creating and getting their feedback and understanding how it was meaningful to them. And so that just continued to, to bring me on this pathway of creating music that would speak to uh, what it means to be a human in the world today, you know, the, the things that we deal with. And so I really try to address those things with my music. The beautiful thing about being a musician is we have this incredible community that supports each other. I've had so many mentors along the way who have inspired me, who have believed in me, who have opened doors for me, who have challenged me. Um, my high school band director, Rick Durango, um, Libby Larson, the composer, who really encouraged me to pursue composition and go to school and think about life as a composer. Um, my teacher in grad school, Kevin Putz, my parents, my family, my friends. Um, it takes a whole community to really make this happen. It's not just me on my own, but it's me respecting and listening to those people who have lifted me up, who have encouraged me, uh, and, and continuing to, to really have a responsibility to create meaningful art. Right? So I could go around and I could just create music that maybe solves some mathematical equation or that is esoteric. Um, but I really believe that the role of music is to initiate positive change and to make a positive impact on the world, to help others to engage, to show and find compassion. Um, and so uh, I, I just am so fortunate to be part of this world and, and I encourage you to continue to find those ways that you can uplift other people and, and to bring beauty into the world because music really can make a difference.